All right, if you have your Bibles with you, I'd ask you to turn to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 2, and we're going to begin reading in the very first verse. Genesis chapter 2, in the very first verse. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them, and on the seventh day, and on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all, from all his work which God created and made. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. And every plant of the field before it was in it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God had not sit, caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. I'd like to preach, the Lord be my helper on the thought, does your soul rejoice? Dear Lord, we thank you for your goodness and watch care. Lord, we thank you for your many blessings that you provide us each day. Lord, for the ones that we see. Lord, it's the ones that we fail to see. Lord, that you would enlighten our eyes to them. Lord, we pray tonight that you would honor your word with the Holy Spirit. Lord, that you would come by and you would refresh those of yours that are here, Lord, and the lost. Lord, that you might convict them unto salvation. Lord, that they might see the hopelessness and helplessness of their circumstance. Lord, that you might enlighten them, that you might give them life according to your mercy and grace, we pray it. Amen. Now let me say as we get started, all life comes from God. All life in every way, from the very smallest plant to the greatest beast on the earth, all life comes from God. Now, I say that to say this, uh, we take life for granted. We take life and all that's around us is an everyday thing. And what will make mankind uh, take life precious is when it's threatened. When it's threatened and the days look bleak and the, the hours toward death is nearing, that is when life becomes precious. And it should be a shame to the Lord's people not to recognize the gift of life. What, what a blessing that it truly is. Now I want you to see that um, he describes very clearly the creation of the whole earth. And I certainly believe in a literal seven or six day creation period. On the seventh day he rested. He created all that we know and see in six literal days. But I want you to see that the creation of man was even more miraculous. Uh, he went a bit further. If you find much of the things that he did in creation, all it was, and mighty was it, but what he did was speak them into being. Let there be light, and there was light. It says that he separated the darkness from the night, and, 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 uh, and, uh, day he, and the light he called day, and the darkness he called night. He did that by the words of his mouth. He created all things except for man, and then he used his hands. That made him special, did it not? That made it different than the other created things. Uh, uh, verse 5, And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground, but there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Now, I want you to see two things in that. First of all, uh, we are just cre created from the earth. The Bible says further over, from uh, dust you are, and for, uh, from dust you were, and, from, and to dust you will return. Uh, that is our makeup. Uh, there was nothing miraculous in that sense that dirt was dirt. But the miraculous event is this. He breathed into his nostrils and he became a living soul. 
That's what distincts us from every other living thing that you can see about. Listen, there's nothing wrong with pets. There's nothing wrong with cats and dogs. If that's your thing. But you know what? They are not equal unto Amen. us because they have not a living soul. Amen. That's what distincts us. That's what makes us the creation of God. Uh, the Bible says man was created in the, in, in the image of God, meaning that we are a three-part creature, just like the Lord God is a three-part God. We were made in His likeness. The rest of the earth, uh, all the animals, the, call, uh, the, the cows and, and the birds, all they are is they have, all they have of themselves is a being. And that's it. And when it's gone, it's gone. But not so with man. We should appreciate the never-dying soul that the Lord God gave us. That is the living part of man. Um, you know, even being aware that you possess a soul is a gift of God. Do you ever think about that? Uh, Brother Junior and I, before services, was talking about a man that we both know. And, and he uh, does not believe in God. He says there is no God. And when this is all over, he'll simply be put into the ground. You know what? That's denying the existence of a soul, is it not? Um, makes us no different than animals, does it not? Everybody says, why is sodomy at such a range today? And by that I mean homosexuality, if you want to call it, call it that. The Bible says they're sodomites. That's what the Bible calls it. Yeah. But you know, you say that today, people already know what you mean. So the best thing you can do uh, is give them an understanding. You know what? If we're no more than animals, why is that wrong? If we're not accountable to God, then everything goes. The, the problem with saying there is no God is there is no accountability to God. But there's both. We are accountable for our actions, who we are, what we do, and we will stand before a most mighty God one day and give an account. So I ask you, First of all, concerning your soul, concerning who you are, what's your, what's your soul like this morning? What's your, where are you, uh, how do you feel concerning eternal things? Go with me to Psalms 84 in the very first verse. Uh, Psalms 84 in the very first verse, uh, this is a psalm of Korah. Now that is not the Korah that the earth opened her mouth and swallowed. That's not that Korah. This Korah was, was a musician of David. He was an individual that wrote songs and psalms in David's court. And this is one of them. Uh, and he begins uh, in uh, Psalms 84 in the very first verse, How amiable are the tabernac thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. How amiable, how beautiful, how desirable are your tabernacles. Now, we know according to the Word of God that the main tabernacle, the tabernacle uh, that the people of Israel had all the time from the days of Moses, even unto the days of Solomon, that tabernacle was the main place. But I want you to see the Bible says how, how amiable are thy tabernacles, plural, more than one. Uh, many. Have you ever thought that the tabernacle is even just creation itself? Look about you. Look out the windows. Look around you. In the morning as the sun rises, does it not declare that I am God? Does it not declare that there's a creator of this place where we live? That is his tabernacle. That's all that he is. My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. Now, did you get that? He, he begins to describe what his soul feels. Remember, we just read that he, that he breathed life into him and he became a living soul. Now we find the nature of this man's soul. My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. Now that's a mouthful to say, because first of all, he described that his soul was longing. You ever wondered... 
what your soul longs for. What, what does it mean to long for something? It means that you want it. It, it means that you desire it. You wish that it was already with you. My soul longeth. It, it desireth. You know what? I believe we live in a day where we really don't necessarily desire to be with the Lord. But Korah did. He, he, he desired, he, he wanted it. He was ready. He, he wanted to be on with the Lord. And that's where he says, my soul longeth for, for, for thy courts. Now that's an unusual word because, you know what? Sometimes I'm a little bit fearful of the Lord's courts. Uh, you know, whether we want to accept it or not, it really makes you no difference if you accept it or not. One day you will stand accountable before God at His great and mighty throne. That is a courtroom. And, you know, when you begin to think what you've done, and I'm not talking about a works-based salvation, but listen, you are accountable to God. When He saved your never dying soul, when He breathed the spiritual life unto you, you are accountable. And listen, lost folks, you're accountable too. Have you ever thought about how much you've done for the glory and the honor for God? That makes me tremble. Korah was ready to go. He was done with this place. He was finished. He said how, how beautiful that would be. What my, my soul just desires it. So my first question to you tonight is this. What does your soul long for? What keeps you going? What's the driving force in your life? That is really what you long for. If all you're interested in is a home here, the Bible says, my dear friend, that we are to be pilgrims and strangers. We don't need a home here. We, we don't need an eternal existence here. Oh, if we could get that thought and understand it as young people and use our energy and our youth for the things of God, how much better we would be. Yeah. But we get so caught up in keeping up with the Joneses one of the three-bedroom brick and all the garbage that goes with it when simply we should be following after what God would have us to do. Yeah. And, and so we see this individual here. He longed his so long. That's a spiritual condition. My soul long with yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. Now I want you to see he was in tune. And this is a rare occasion in, in, in the individual's life. But his heart, soul, and body was all in tune, longing for the Lord. Now man's three parts is heart, soul, and body. That, that's our three parts, and God is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. That's His three parts. You know, you think about how few times in your life all three has been in sync. But when we can get in sync on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's a special time. And Korah was there. He was enjoying it uh, to, to a, a wonderful, wonderful degree. So what is your soul? What is your body? What are you interested in uh, this evening? Verse 3. <laughs> uh, yea, the sparrow hath found a house, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young, even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are they that dwell in the house, in thine house, and will, and will be praising thee, Selah. Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, whose heart are the ways of them. Now, last thing I wanna, want you to look at in that text is it says, blessed are their hearts that are, their ways are with them. Now, what, what is your heart like tonight? Are, are you in sync with the person of God? What, what, what brings you to a, per, to a point where you're more interested in God than you're interested in yourself? What, what brings you to the point that you're more interested in preaching than watching TV. What, what, what brings you to the point where you're more desirous of the, of the food of the Spirit than the food of the flesh? What, what brings us to that point? And listen, I see today among the Lord's churches that less and less and less do we have ourselves centered on the things of God. We're very much tuned to this world. We're very much involved with the world. And so we find here that, that the writer, Korah, his, his desire was to understand what his soul longed for. 
Now I'll say this and we'll move on. Whatever your soul is longing for, be honest about it. Yeah. Don't say you desire to be here and hear good preaching if what you really desire is to stay at home. Don't, don't say that you love the things of God and you'd rather be around God's people than anybody else if your real desire is to be down at work. We're, 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 you know, honesty, if you really want to get to the point where you, you really want your soul desiring God, the first thing you've got to do is be honest. And, and many, many times today we're not. We're just not an honest people anymore. Uh, you want to know when revival will come? I can tell you when revival will come is when God's people get honest enough to say, hey, we're in trouble. You, wanna, you, want, you know when the Lord will begin to save is when God's people get down and mean business with Him. The uh, Bible says, My hand is not slack, as some men count slackness. But He's strong and powerful and mighty. I am the Lord, I change not. Malachi 3 6. So then, where's the problem? Why? It has to be with us, doesn't Amen. it? That, that, that's the only thing that, that is the possibility to be left. And so we see that, first of all, when it comes to this beautiful soul, that this precious thing that He's created, what does yours long for? What is yours uh, desire on a routine basis? Psalm 63, just a little further back. Psalms 63. Psalm 63, this time a psalm of David. Uh, I do want you to note that at this point, David was in the wilderness. And tonight, I don't know what your situation is. I don't know uh, what your circumstance is spiritually tonight. But you may be in a wilderness. And listen, you don't have to be out in what we consider abject sin, whatever you want to define that is. I've never understood that term because, listen, coldness is sin. Ignoring the Word of God is sin. And, and certainly, we often look at sodomy and we often look at gambling and we look, often look at, at, at drinking as different kinds of sin. But listen, let me tell you, sin is sin is sin. If nothing else, the law accomplished that, it defined sin. And so we see then that we as the Lord's people... Uh, <laughs> Certainly need to see what our soul's desire is. Psalm 63 in the very first verse. Psalm 63 in the verse, first verse, the Bible says, Oh God, Thou art my God. Now, I want you to see that's a mouthful to say when you're on the run from uh, King Solomon. The, I mean, uh, King Saul, that's a mouthful to say when you're the one under the gun. When illness comes to the, your way and you're under the gun, that's a mouthful to say. When there's no money left and you have no food, will you even then say, oh God, my God, are you going to still claim him as yours? You remember uh, the three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, how could they excuse themselves from the flame? By simply denying God. That's all they had to do. But here we find David in a bad situation too. And he says, oh God, my God. You belong to me. I belong to you. That, that was their, uh, that was their, thri that was his thrill, his desire. Oh God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. Now, I want you to see two things. First of all, he says, I'm going to seek you early. You know, when most people seek God, when the problem's already on them. Yeah. <laughs> we need to get in the situation where we seek him early. Yeah. Now, you may be like my wife. You may not be a morning person. And my daughter's inherited that trait. Uh, but you know what? We need to seek him early. I believe that means circumstance. So I don't mean it. I, it's not wrong getting up early and, and seeking the things of God. I, I'm an early person. I like to do that. But what I, what I think he really means is this. You're seeking before there's a problem. Yeah. 
You, you, you seek Him before the enemy arrives. You, you, you seek Him before, before things get bad. Seek Him early. Oh, I will seek you early. You know what? Many times, it, and we think when we go down to the house of God, and I think of even back to little smidgens that I can remember when I was a boy, and seemingly God met with His people. You know what? We looked back on that and said, oh, those preachers were a different brand. No, no, uh, mankind has not changed. The preachers weren't a different brand. God's people were a different brand. They sought God early. They desired more than anything else that God would meet with them. Oh, God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee. In a dry and thirsty land. Now I want to note, note two things. He was thirsty. And it says that, that even his flesh began to long for God. See, that's what we just read about with old Korah, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. it? It began to impact his flesh. People, oh brother Larry, you ever going to quit preaching on dress? No. I'll never, with the help of Almighty God, I'll never give that up. And uh, I'll keep going with it. But you know what? What, what? what that really digs people, it's not so much that it's the fact of this. It points out very well that our flesh is involved. Am I saying you have to wear a dress as lady to, to be saved? No, but I will say this. Salvation will impact what you do. It will impact what you wear. It will do those things. He, he was so in tune with God, even his flesh was in unison. That's a rare thing, isn't it? That, that's an unusual occurrence. And, and so certainly we should be the same way and be, be the same desire as to be like David was. Verse 2, he says... Uh, to see thy power and thy glory so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Oh, what a blessed thing. You know what will get your soul in the right condition to see the glory of God? Now, when we think about that, I often think about old uh, Isaiah down at the temple. He said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Now, this little building we meet in, a lot of times we anticipate to meet him here, don't we? But you know where I've seen him high and lifted up? In nursing homes. I've seen him high and lifted up when our oldest son was sick and we weren't sure what was even happening with him. I've seen him high and lifted up. See, it, it, it doesn't have to be in a church building. David wasn't at, When David wrote this, he was on the run. He, he wasn't in the tabernacle. He was on the run. And he said, I saw him high and, uh, high and lifted up. Listen, turn your circumstances into a situation where you can see God high and lifted up. When we get the bad news and the devil just sits back and has a glee and throws it back in the face of the almighty God of heaven. When, when circumstances comes our way <laughs> and we're like, well, I don't know what I'm going to do now. You don't know what you're going to do. What about pray? You don't know what you're going to do. How about give God the praise for the situation you're in? If your next breath's your last, give God the praise for it. There's where we should abide. But this flesh will fight you tooth and toenail. Don't, don't doubt that because you will, you, will have a, you will have a real problem getting down to the point where David and Korah were. Verse 3, because thy loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise thee. Thy loving kindness. That's verse 3. Thy loving kindness is better than life. Oh, if we could get into such a condition as that. You know what? I, I have to say very shamefully, but admittedly, I don't know that I've ever been there. Just better, you're, you're better than life. Thy loving kindness. So it, it's far beyond life itself. You know what? Despite what we say from the youngest uh, little Gracie to the oldest one in the, in the building tonight, we cherish life. That's right. We cherish life. But you know when you're in tune with God, you get to that point a few times in your life, whether you go or you just stay, it's fine with you. And sometimes even desires, hey, I'm just going home. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for the Lord took him. 
Ain't it was in tune with God, was it not? Ain't it knew what that was about? And so we see then, as the Lord's people, certainly we need to be as they were. Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. I will, thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. Now did you get that? I will lift up my hands in thy name. Very frequently, very recently in the Word of God, very, very frequently when I, when I began to read and study, I'm brought to situations, I'm brought to uh, uh, sections in the Scripture, places in the Scripture where it talks about lifting hands. Here we find that David says, I will lift my hands and praise thee. Why? Because he was in tune with God. Why did the Bible say in James, I, I, I would that you lift holy hands everywhere. You know why? Because it's praiseworthy. It points people to Christ. It shows them who he is. Certainly, that's where we should be too. So we find that we as the Lord's people, our soul will give forth the praise. Our, our soul, <laughs> our soul should be lifting him up. Look at me in Proverbs. Unfortunately, we always have to look at the opposite side of the things of God. Proverbs 13, verse 4. Proverbs um, 13, uh, verse 4. The soul of the sluggard desireth and hath nothing. Now a lot of people say, well that, you know, that, that no good, so and so that won't do nothing, he ought to have to go hungry. And, and they'll just glean, glean the skim off that scripture. But notice what it says, the soul, the soul, the living inward man, the soul of the sluggard. Now how many spiritual sluggards do you know? I know a bunch of them. I, I couldn't begin to name them. I, I would never do that because sometimes I consider myself a spiritual slugger. But listen, a slugger is one that won't work. Man, we as Baptists, grace for this and grace for that and grace for this. But you know what? There's a great deal to be said about works. A slugger is not going to enjoy the presence of Almighty God. Did you get that? Going to go hungry. He said, oh, why don't we feel like we once did? Because we're sluggards. Why, why, don't, why don't we enjoy it like we once did? Because we're sluggards. Go back to that time. And you know what? Every time a great revival, you look back on those days in your life and those times in your history, I think what you'll find is you are a praying and studying people in that time. Sluggards don't enjoy it. Sluggards don't get the very best. The soul, the soul of a sluggard desireth and have nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. The soul of the diligent. You know what diligent means? Paying attention to detail. Being diligent. Piece by piece by piece. Knowing not only what you believe, but why you believe it, and being able to back it up with Scripture. That's being diligent. That, that's, that's why. So those individual souls, those individuals, we're going to be filled. If you know why God's sovereign, even in the electing of mankind to himself, if you can grab that out of the Bible, you'll be satisfied. If you, if you understand and know, when Stephen looked up, you, you know, you, you think about what it would be to be stoned. Have you ever thought about that? What, what a measure. And, and the fear that must possess most people in the stoning and knowing the rocks are going to be, maybe that first one misses it and you think, oh, this one's going to come and get me. Not so with Stephen. So he lifted up and said, Lord, unto thee I commend my spirit. And he fell asleep. In the, in the midst of adversity, he fell asleep. Why? Because he had the peace of God that passeth all understanding. And so, uh, 
when you begin to think of your soul situation, are you getting nourished enough? Last place in the book of Ecclesiastes. Some of Solomon's last writings. He was an old man. He began to see things differently. He uh, began to see the value of life was not necessarily found in money. He began to understand and know that he'd made a lot of mistakes in parenting. He began to understand and know that he'd made some compromises in order to have as many wives that he had. He made some, he made some spiritual sacrifices and, and, uh, and, began, to, and began to offer uh, on ungodly uh, on things on ungodly altars. He began to change in his older years. And so with that understanding, Ecclesiastes 6, ver, uh, Ecclesiastes 6 in the very first verse, there is an evil which I have seen under the sun, and it is common, it is every day, it is frequent among men. A man to whom God hath given riches, wealth, and honor, so that he wanteth nothing for his soul, for all that he desires, yet God giveth him not power to eat thereof, but a stranger eateth it. This is vanity, and it is an evil disease. If a man beget a hundred children... And live many years, so that the days of their years be many, and his soul be not filled with good. Also that he have no burial, I say that an untimely birth is better than he. Now did you get that? His soul is not filled with good. And if this individual has all this wealth, all this money, all these riches, has a bunch of children, and has heritage below him, but if his soul is not filled with good. Now, I want you to see, it does not say filled with good works. It says filled with good. How does good get within us? It's the imputed righteousness of Christ. And that comes by God. Soul filled with good. So I ask you tonight, in closing, is your soul filled with good? Now, I'm not asking you about how good you are. I'm saying that you have the imputed righteousness of Christ. That, that's what fills our soul. That's what makes us whole. And listen, there's no sinner's prayer. There's no flopping around the floor that will impute the righteousness of Christ to you. He does it himself. Seek the Lord while you may be found. Trust Him with everything that you have. Mm -hmm.